Hi, welcome to another session of Valuing and Analyzing Companies. In today's session, I will be assessing the firm and equity value of Visa. If you're watching this video and you have a debit card or a credit card in your wallet, there is a 54% chance that that card was issued by Visa. The rest of 46% of the market is dominated by MasterCard, American Express, and Discover. The former two, which are Discover and American Express, are a smaller player and the main competitor of Visa is MasterCard. As far as the business model is very simple. Visa facilitates the transaction between consumer merchants and the banks or the financial institute where the money is being held and take a commission for providing that service. The link to this collab file is in the description of this video. In addition to that, the link to the Python file that I have developed that performs a DC evaluation will be also in the description of this video. You can go ahead and download that from my GitHub or my Google Drive and perform a DC evaluation on any company that you're interested in, whether that's Visa or any other one. I'll be creating a new walkthrough video that shows how to use that Python script to value any companies. So with that said, let's get to the valuation. Current ratio of Visa is about 1.44. Total asset divided by total liability is about 135, which means the comp company has a strong balance sheet. These numbers are adjusted for goodwill. I exclude goodwill because if goodwill is just a plug variable that accountants plug in when the balance sheet doesn't balance. It usually shows up when the company make an acquisition and they overpay and usually they pay premium for acquiring the target firm. And then in order for the accountant to justify uh, the amount of they paid extra, they will create a plug variable called it goodwill and they post it to the a balance sheet as an intangible. You don't want to count it in terms of an asset for assessing the solvency of a company, but you want to count it in terms of how well a company reinvests because the premium they are paying could be destroying value or they could be creating value. It depends how much additional incremental operating income they are able to generate on top of acquiring those asset. The debt to equity ratio is about 5%. That means the firm is pretty much funded with equity. There's not much of leverage going on. They have about 24, 22 billion in debt and 22 billion in cash. So net debt is about zero. The Buffett exchange ratio is about 15% consistently, about uh, below 15% which is great. Warren Buffett likes this number to be below 30%. This number is SG&A divided by gross profit. This means basically after you take care of the cost of goods, so what's left to be, to be shared between the employees and the owners of the company. The revenue growth rate for the past few years, we see on trailing 12 months quarterly basis, uh, this number has been about 10%. Then we see the pandemic effect, then we see this high growth number about 20% but they're not sustainable, it would be fair to assume that if Visa continues its growth rate, rate of about 10%, an analyst estimate for the next couple of years is also in, in, in range of about 10%. The company is having fabulous operating margin about 60, 64%, which is really superior. You don't find as many businesses out there that have this amount of, of moat around it, consistently providing high operating margin the, relative to MasterCard, Visa has a higher hand. They have 60, 64, while MasterCard has about 50, 55%. In terms of return invested capital, MasterCard has the higher hand, which means uh, they generate more return on invested capital. And also, as far as sales to capital ratio, again, MasterCard has a higher hand. They reinvest better in the business. Uh, looking at the return on invested capital on quarterly basis at based on trading 12 months number. That number for Visa is about somewhere between this green line and blue line, which is about 30%. Again, fabulous. You can find many companies out there that generate this amount of return on invested capital. The other metrics that I would take a look at is the cash flow and the dividend. I want the dividend that are paid to investor be less than the operating cash flow. If the dividend paid is more than operating cash flow, it's really, either the company paying the retained earnings or they are raising debt or equity, which is a very dumb action. And a lot of companies actually do that. They raise debt and they pay a dividend, which I will stay away from those companies. So let's talk about the valuation and some statistics here. In 2021, Visa processed about 13 trillion worth of transaction volume wise from processing that 13 trillion 
transaction, they were able to generate 24 billion in revenue. That translates to 18.53 basis point on every dollar that they process. What I'm trying to assess in 16 years, how much dollar volume Visa will be processing in the worth of transactions. In 2021, the world GDP was about $88 trillion. I can assume that the world GDP growth rate is about 3.8% based on what we see in the bond market in the 10-year T-bond rate. And the reason I'm using the 10-year T-bond rate is because I'm doing all this analysis in US dollars. So I'm being consistent in my currency of choice. The 10-year T-bond rate, it's supposed to reflect our expected long-term inflation plus real growth rate of the economy. I'm going to let that number to compound for 16 years. I'm also assuming that there will be about 10% worth of all transactions that will be either in cash or different form that Visa will not be able to capture. In 2038, there will be worth of 143 trillion of transaction. Out of that, 71, roughly 72 trillion dollar of that would be processed by Visa. And based on what we learned in that ratio, Visa revenues would be about 133 billion by 2038, which means the revenue is going to go up by about four and a half fold. So that's the big picture that I will be focusing on. So I'm going to solve what growth rate I need to give to them and how long I can sustain that growth rate for Visa to get to 130 billion and then where the operating margin will be and then getting the free cash flow to the firm and the present value of the company. So that's how I'm approaching this valuation. So that's my big picture. The story I'm having to say is Visa continues its growth to capture more opportunities in the electronic payment space. Their market share will be reduced from 54 to 50% as there will be more players coming to this space and they were going expanding more internationally and there could be a, a, existing uh, players within those countries. The management keeps the company well run as they used to for the past 10 years and they will grow from 30 billion to 130 billion in 16 years as we mentioned earlier. So that is my base case scenario. The rest of it is just number crunching and math. I don't want to bore you with going through line by line of this um, of the model, but essentially, this uh, you want the risk free rate, the equity risk premium in the market, which is about five point three, that Dr. Aswath the Modron publishes every month on his website based on what the stocks are expected to earn for the next five years. And here are the growth rate that I will be assessing for Visa. That's I, I'm going to let them to grow in the first cycle for six years from seven to 15%. Then I'm going to slow down the growth rate from 14 to eight. And then I'm going to make another cycle for the growth that will be from 11 to 4%. And that will be my terminal growth rate, which ties to the risk-free rate or the the 10 year T-bond rate that I talked about. The sales to capital ratio is how much they need to reinvest back to the business to grow the business. The corporate and current operating margin, I'm assuming that from 64, they will be reduced to 60. They're going to have more competition. They're going to hire more people. Uh, The economy of the scale will be eroded, could be eroded. So uh, in looking at MasterCard, you know, they'd be at 55. So I think, you know, Visa uh, have higher chance that number would slide lower as opposed to, you know, expanding higher. And I'm going to assume that that phenomenon is going to kick in. Uh, gradually from year four moving forward. Uh, and I'm also assuming that, you know, the management will be generating superior returns, 6% higher in uh, relative to their cost of capital in perpetuity, which is a relatively high premium. Performing that DC evaluation, here is my revenue. Here's my growth rate. Here are the margin. Here is EBIT earnings before interest and taxes. This is the sales to capital ratio. These are the reinvestment, how much they have to reinvest to get the, that growth. Uh, after tax operating income, subtract reinvestment, you get free cash flow to the firm. Then I discount the free cash flow to the firm to get the present value of them. And here's my terminal value. So by the 2038, roughly speaking, the revenue is going to be about 132, as I as, as we as we uh, expected. And the, the value of operating assets come to be about 397 billion. You add cash, subtract debt, you end up with intrinsic equity value in the business of $397 billion. 
the current equity value in the business is about 442. So I find the stock price to be about 10% overvalued based on the story I said, but this is a point estimate. In order to deal with the uncertainty around all about every parameters in this in the model, which contains from risk-free rate, the equity risk premium, the operating margin, the growth rate, etc., I create a Monte Carlo DCF valuation. It's really not rocket science. I come up with a different range for every parameter that went to the model from a different from a different distribution, and I perform fifteen thousand DCFs. I every time I draw a random number that is within the range of of, of a specific parameter. So let's say, for instance, for terminal operating margin, every time for fifteen thousand times, I'm going to randomly draw a number that is between fifty three and sixty five at highest, and it's centered around sixty percent and I do a DCF valuation. Then I do it again, and I do it again, over and over and over, and I do it for every parameter that went to the model. And I'm able to generate this histogram. What does it tell me? This is the reasonable possible uh, scenarios that could play out for a visa. So this is very extremely helpful for me to make a judgment that in terms of range, where the reasonable range is, for the equity value for visa for equity at stake in visa so my high my low case would be 356 which is 15th percentile of this distribution the base case about 392 relative to what we got at the point estimate and the highest i would be paying for visa would be 435 and i see the stock is being richly 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 priced so with that i see about 10 percent downside is it too much no but could it go higher? Of course, Visa is always traded at a premium. But again, I you know assume that you know they will be generating higher return relative to their cost of capital. So I don't think if the excess premium that is being priced in Visa's stock price is justifiable in my point of view. It is what it. It's a good business, no doubt. I love it, and uh, if I get the opportunity to buy it be somewhere between three fifty to three ninety, I'll definitely definitely make that call. With that said, I hope that you found this session useful. Thank you very much for listening and learning about Visa with me, and I see you in the next video.